Might be better just sit here. This okay, I hope everything is visible. Okay, so can I start? Okay. Um, okay, so hi, thanks for showing up. I'm Sagnik. I'm going to talk about shared information and Markov tree based models. And I'll try not to look back so much because, anyway. Um, so the first thing, so there is, of, of course, shared information and Markov tree based models. So we are going to start with shared information. Um, okay. So the question that we want to ask is how to capture dependence among multiple random variables. And the function that we are looking at today for this purpose is shared information. So how is this defined? Um, so shared information between of these random variables is defined as this weird quantity here, um, which is the Kullback like the divergence here between certain things with a normalization and a minimization outside. So let me spend some time describing what exactly this is doing. So one thing to observe here is that the right side of the Kullback like the divergence is like a, this is like a product distribution and it's a product on, so you, you, you take, these random variables, construct the marginals on these sets by you, and you product them, right? And you take the divergence between the whole joint distribution and this product distribution. So one thing that you can try is, it can be written like as follows. So uh, here you get the entropy of those same subsets of random variables. You add them all up and subtract out the total entropy of the random variables. And you minimize it over all possible uh, ways of partitioning this thing along with the normalization here. So in a picture, so let's say these are my random variables. There are however many of them. And we first, we group them up, uh, construct the marginal on each of these groups, uh, take the constructor product distribution by producting all of these marginals and compute the divergence and then minimize over all possible ways of constructing these, this partition of random variables. Okay. So since this is like the basic object that I'm going to be talking about for the entire talk, uh, any questions about this definition at this point? So this is the right way to... I'll come to that. So like about half of my talk is basically just, just to answer that question. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, so K is arbitrary. Yeah. So this minimization, if you look at it, this min here, has the number of atoms in your partition. So atoms in my partition are basically these sets, this, that set, and so on. So for all constructs, I style you with that. I'm sorry? I style you with all constructs, I style you with that. So you take, so let's say, let's say, um, this is my pi u. Mm -hmm. So you take the joint distribution construct the marginal on these random variables. Mm -hmm. And so you will have a marginal here, a marginal here, and a marginal here, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then you construct a joint distribution 
a new one by taking a product of these marginal distributions, okay? Which is the thing that is appearing here, this term. And then you construct this divergence, normalize it, and then minimize over all possible ways of taking this partition. Okay. Good, so we know what the definition is now. And for the next about 20 or 30 minutes, I'll basically answer your question about why should we care about this particular measure? No, and, it's slightly different. Okay. I understand that the, a measure like that is, is useful. Why is this the right way to do this? I will attempt to answer that question. And then at some point I'll say that, okay, like I finished answering the question as far as my slides go. And then I'll ask you again if I've sufficiently answered your question. So, okay. So let's see to some special cases of what's going on. Um, one thing to note here is that this, it doesn't make sense to consider the, so it, it doesn't make sense to consider the trivial partition as in you put all the atoms in one set or, or all the variables in one set because then this this um this divergence just becomes zero correct so you will notice here that this min over the size of the partition or the number of subsets in the partition that goes from two up to m so that is excluded so now if you had just two random variables the only non-trivial partition is just like you put one of them in one atom, the other one in the other atom, and therefore the minimization goes away and you're left with just mutual information, okay? Um, if you have three random variables, then you can look at, uh, so there are four possible partitions. Uh, one of them is like one and two, three, and the three similar ones. And there's one which is a single turn of like you put each variable in its own atom. And then you co you compute all of these quantities, pick up the minimum, and that will be your shared information. Right? So these are two special cases that are useful to look at. Okay, so now we'll quickly go over some properties of shared information. Um, so first of all, notice that it's always non-negative because this divergence term here is always non-negative, um, which is like a standard notion result in information theory. And therefore, one nice property that you would expect a measure of dependence to have, um, which is non-negativity, holds for this measure. So that's one. Um, the second one is slightly more interesting. So what it says is that if I team these random variables together, then my shared information can either stay the same or increase. So what I mean by that is, so let's say I consider, so I take this set XM and I look at any partition of it. So let's say pi one up to pi K. And so then I have these legitimate random variables instead of having x1 up to xm here, I can construct this set, which is x pi one and up to x pi k, right? So what I'm doing is I'm constraining these things to, so whatever was in pi one, I'm constraining them to always be inside pi. So when you, uh, so if I if I want to con if I want to compute the SI of this thing, and I am going to do uh, minimize uh, minimization over partitions of this, um, let's say divergence quantity. It's clear that whatever will be the partition here 
is already contained in the partition that I had originally for these random variables, right? So therefore, this SI will always be greater than or equal to the SI of one of two x. Is that clear? Cool. So this is another property that if we if we bunch if we start bunching random variables together, then this uh, shared information can only increase. Okay. Uh, there's a third property which is kind of reminiscent of what happens for just normal mutual information, which is that, which is this one, which is the data processing inequality. Okay. So if a, so this is in words, I'm going to make this formal in a second. So if a single random variable is processed individual independently of the other random variables, then the SI of the new set can only go lower. Now, what I mean by that is, so let's say I had x1 up to xm as the original set, and I construct x1 prime, uh, x2 to xm, the new set. Then, and, and we have this property that x1 prime, x1, xm. Uh, so, are you all familiar with this notation? That is a, okay. So, this denotes that this is a Markov chain. Okay. So, like, so these three, random variables form a Markov chain between them. And what we have is SI of x1 prime and x2 to m that is always less than or equal to SI of uh, x1. So if you process these things, so one example that you can think of is uh, I have this original set x1 up to xm and I replace x1 with some deterministic function of, so let's say x1 prime is equal to some deterministic function of x1. Then this Markov chain will hold and we will have this property that the shared information can only decrease. Um, so let me quickly go over the proof of this statement because it, so mm, wait. So it's not particularly important to do this proof, but it's kind of, it will show you the kind of simple and easy ideas that are used in some of the later proofs that I'm going to do. So it's kind of instructive to just look at what this thing is doing. So the way I want to do it is, so one way of taking this Markov chain, this one, is to write that the mutual information between x1 prime and x2 up to xm conditioned on x1 is zero. So this thing here is equivalent this statement here. Everyone agree with that? Okay. So I'm going to take this thing and kind of manipulate it. Okay. So 
I'm going to say that x1 prime with x2 up to xm equal uh, to zero. This is what we originally had. So um, now I have this object to consider, which is the SI of these things. So x1 up to xm. So let's say that my um, so let's say the partition by one to by k achieves SI of x one to x m. So what I mean by that is that one over k minus one sum over h of x by i, i going from one to k, h of x n, this equals the si, okay? Now, one way of, sorry, so one way of writing this is as follows. Okay, before I come to that, let's say that my x1 originally belonged to the, the atom pi k. So it's in the last bit. Um, okay, so one way of writing this is to expand it in this way. So I of x2 or sorry Um, can you see how that would come? Like you just use the chain rule on this thing and you will get the terms that you want from the major information. Um, okay, so if you look at this last term, x1 belongs somewhere here in pi k. Right? So what I'm going to do is, um, so I'm going to take this thing again and try to push in this pi k somehow inside here. So the way to do that, is to say that I of So the way this follows is by taking some terms here and pushing them here. That's by chain rule. Um, okay. And now basically I can take anything that is here and push them back on this side of the mutual information and still maintain this to be zero. So, uh, let's see. Uh, 
and then <clears throat> now if i call this one as x by k prime and xm without by k and x by k here then what we have just shown is this markov chain uh, let me put it somewhere here that x by k prime which is in pi k i have taken pi taken x1 and replaced it with x1 prime this thing x by k which is the original pi k and the rest will come here right so from this Markov chain, if I apply the data processing inequality for mutual information, I know that the mutual information between this one and this one will be less than the mutual information between this one and that one, right? And if you look at what's going on here in this last job, it's precisely the mutual information between this one and that one that is appearing here. Can you see it? So, okay. So, so look at this term, right? The last mutual information. So notice that since X1 was in pi K, the other terms have not changed at all. So this last term, which is the mutual information between pi k and the rest, is the term that appears if I construct the mutual information here, right? Now, if I replace it by pi k prime, that is change x1, then that mutual information is going to decrease, right? So then um, whatever I have constructed here, which was equal to the SI, I have now given you a partition for the new set, which has less of this value than previously, right? And now eventually I can minimize over partitions and it will go even lower. Right? So then SI of the new thing will be less than equal to SI of the old thing. Is that argument clear? Cool. So this is from this paper by so I'll, I'll come to a brief history of shared information in a way, but this is one of the interesting results that carry over from what you would expect from, um, from the properties of mutual information to shared information. So I'm going to make the point throughout that uh, shared information is a generalization of mutual information, and I'll come to more reasons as to why you should believe me for on that. Okay, great. So um that's that's one property another property is slightly more even more interesting so if i have an si achieving partition each non singleton atom has at least as much si as the full set of variants uh what that means is again if uh pi 1 up to pi k achieve si then si of pi i will be greater than or equal to si of xm now let me skip the proof of this statement. So the this the statement is not hard to show. The the thing that you do is as a very very uh, bird's eye view sketch of what's going on. You take uh, this atom. So let's say you want to show this result for pi one, okay? And let's say pi one is a non singleton atom. So you would take this pi one, construct construct any partition of pi one. Right. So if you partition pi one, then that is another partition of this of the original XM. Correct. So I started with a partition of 
which is which was pi one up to pi k. I partition something in one of the atoms that will give me a partition of the whole thing, right? So then, um, what you can show is that the SI of the whole thing uh, will turn out to be some linear combination of SI of x pi one or okay, let's say SI of x pi one plus one minus alpha SI of the new partition. And now this thing here is a new partition of XM and that thing will be greater than equal to this thing here because ah, actually this is going to be the opposite way. Wait just a second. It goes the other way. Sign of new partition. Sign of X. Does that give me what we want? Mm. So this thing is bigger than equal to. Okay, I'm kind of so it's something like this is going to work. Let me let me skip it for now. Um, but what's going to happen is that like one of these things can be expressed as a linear combination of the other two, and what you can observe is that this this whatever is the new partition that will have um, the the divergence expression will be greater than equal to the SI of X M. And yeah, so okay, I got it. So if if this thing is bigger than or equal to the SI of XM, and this one was already SI of XM, this entire quant quantity has to be like has to be between SI of X pi one and SI of XM. And the only way that can happen while maintaining this inequality is if this thing is bigger than SI of XM. Does that make sense? So you have SI of XM here, yes. right? And then you, you are constructing something which is here. This thing lies in the middle of somewhere in between SI of XM and this quantity, so this quant, so this thing must be somewhere here. It cannot be here, for example. Okay. So I have not told you what these alphas and one minus alpha are going to be, but this is the property that we get. Now the reason why this is interesting is because you can actually make a stronger statement and replace this. Um, this this greater than equal to with a strict inequality. And the thing that lets you do that is this theorem again from the paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to come to that. So there's this notion of what's called a fundamental partition. So the idea here is if you construct the set of all SI achieving partitions, right? So every partition that achieves the minimum, then it can be shown, and this paper does it, is that one partition in this set will be finer than every other partition. What that means is you take the atoms of this fundamental partition, you combine them in some way, and you will obtain every other SI achieving partition by just combining things from this fundamental partition. Yeah, it's a partial order. Yeah. The lowest element. Yeah, the lowest element. So and and this result that I showed you here, which is that um the SI of the 
atom is always greater than or equal to SI of XM. That turns up in the fundamental partition as a characterization of it, which is that if uh, you have some subset such that their shared information is bigger than or equal to the shared information of the whole thing, then this set will either be a subset of an atom it will be a subset of an atom of the fundamental partition. So it's a characterization of this object here. And you can say something even stronger, which is if C is maximal, as in C has this property that its shared information is greater, but no superset of C has that property. Right? So if you add elements, any element to C, then this property will not hold anymore. If that happens, then you have exactly characterized what the atoms of the fundamental partition are. Okay. So this is kind of an, an interesting. So it's I'm not at all going to touch the proof of this statement, apart from what I've just shown you, because this has this needs like heavy machinery. Like I can uh, this will need a talk of its own just to get to the point that there's a there's this partial order of partitions and it's not an easy statement to show but it's done in this paper if you're interested you can take a look it uses some dilworth truncations and polyhedral optimization and yeah lattices yeah it's a bit of a mess it uses the submodularity of entropy and to be honest that dilworth truncation proof is a like I have read through it. It's kind of hard to understand the way they have written it, but it's there. Like you can show this result. Um, but I'm going to skip any mention of the heavy machinery for, for the purposes of this talk. So that is one property of the shared information. Okay. So uh, I'm wondering whether to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. Actually, um, it is here somewhere. So okay. Don't look at this table too strictly. Let me do a couple of these. Okay. So. The point of this table, which is from this paper again, is that you can have multiple generalizations of mutual information. Let me just show you what one of them might look like, uh, which will be very familiar to from previous parts of this talk. So one of them, which is this one, so JD of XM is called actually sorry let me do JT that's easier so it's the what will be total relation and that says that that is equal to m minus one, the divergence of, so, okay. The original formulation did not have this normalization in front, but just to maintain a connection with um, the shared information function, I'm going to just push that normalization in. And um, so that is the divergence between So this is exactly what would happen in shared information if the partition that you're considering is just the singleton partition. Right? So in shared information, you are minimizing over multiple partitions. Here, there is just one partition. Right? So what this table shows, and so what the authors here did, they picked up six different um, so five other generalizations of mutual information. 
picked up a few um what some 10 or 12 properties that you expect a measure of correlation to have and they showed that the shared information is the only one that has all of these properties so i'm just going to pick up let's say a couple i don't want to do all 12 of these what are the uh, the measures the j so okay so the jm is what's called McGill multiple mutual information okay. it has a definition uh the dual so jd is the let me just see with that the, fo the first i is the shared first i is the shared information so jd is called hans dual total correlation that's looks somewhat similar and these the the other ones so these two they are like at least in this paper they did not look at the so they are generalizations of mutual information not exactly generalizations but so these are basically gax corner and wind it and you can generalize those to multiple random variables that's a bit tricky um, but what these went to show is that there are some properties that mutual information has that these two don't have and so on. Yeah. So Yeah. I think I've seen something on Viners, but the that generalization to generalization to there is, yeah, there is one, yeah. There is. Uh forgot the authors. I, I told you to know about it. Yes, we did that. So it's not it's not that old. It's not that old. Increases, yes. I think the name of the paper is Common Randomness of M Random Variables, but I, I forgot who the authors are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was no follow up. On there was no follow up on that. Yeah. yeah, it's not that old. It's like seven, eight years. It's not. It's not. Yeah. It's not. So I think 2015 or 2015. Yeah, 2015, 16. I've seen the same paper here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nothing, nothing came yeah, up after that. Yeah. yeah. I think it was, a, I think they introduced the measure and did some stuff, but the operational meaning was not, not exactly clear. clear. Yeah. yeah. So I will mention, so let me do. So some of these are, easy to explain like for example symmetric means you if you permute the order if you permute the random variables then the then the measure remains the same uh, data processing inequality we have just seen uh, non-negativity we have just seen um, another interesting one is entropic so entropic is the one if you notice that the Gaksh corner and the binary common information do not satisfy. So entropic basically means that the um, that the value of the measure is going to look of this form, which is so this is entropic. So sum over some some sets B with some coefficients of the entropy of some subset of random variables. Right. So clearly mutual information has that form and the rest of them all do like uh, clearly you can also you know expand this out in the proper in in this way uh, but without going into the definitions the winder and the kakshwan it cannot be done in the same way um there is one which i do want to talk about mm. 
And you do that compression separately, correct? So, so yeah. yeah. So since we have said so much about Gartron, let me just write down the definition of it. Um, so let's say GK of X1 and X2 is equal to the max over Z, the entropy, and such that Z f of x1 and you can see why that interpretation kind of matches up with this operational meaning or that operational meaning matches up with the formula that we have Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So one, so a few of these that I do want to mention is basically this set here, which is correlative, mutually correlative, and strictly mutually correlative, which are three properties that um shared information has and you will notice that other than correlative the other ones don't have right so what correlative means is um if the underlying random variables are mutually independent then the measure should be zero right? which it's clear that shared information will be because then all of your individual entropy terms just expand into the individual entropies and so does the joint. Uh, if you look at the, yeah. So then if, if everything is independent, then this distribution here and this distribution here are the same. Um, mutually correlative means that it is zero if, so, okay, let's say, let's do strictly mutually correlative first. So, strictly mutually correlative is, so zero if and only if underlying RVs So let's say you can identify some two sets of random variables, which are independent, then two or more, let's say, then the measure should be zero for that particular case. And if I remove the if and only if, so if I make this just into if, then you get mutually correlative. And you will notice that shared information is strictly mutually correlative because first of all shared information um, will be zero if 
there exists a, a partition such that this measure here and this measure here turn out to be the same, which then implies that there's some independent structure. And again, and you can also go the other way with this argument. Okay. So there are some, so there are some other properties here as well, which I'm going to skip for now. Like I've mostly mentioned all of them. Um, but yeah, so we can see that shared information has some nice properties that you would want out of a out of a measure of dependence. Okay, so that's all well and good. Are there any operational interpretations of this? So, for example, what do I mean by operational interpretation? Um, the let's say for mutual information, it turns up as the channel capacity in the channel capacity theorem. So are there some similar things that happen for shared information? That is the question that I'm asking here. Um, do I want to? Um, let me do the second one first, which is communication for omniscience. And then I'll come back to the secret case if I have thing. So before going here, uh, let me quickly talk about what is the Slepian wolf problem. So here the question is, let's say you have two random variables, x and y, and these have some joint distribution. So there's some pxy that is governing both. And you get n length sequences independently at random from pxy, right? And you pass this through an encoder. So an encoder sees this, this sequence. Another encoder sees this sequence. And both of their outputs go to some common decoder G. Right? And then G has to output x hat n, y hat n, which should be close to x n comma y n. So this is a multi-terminal um, lossless source coding problem. Right? So this is your setup. You see different, uh, two different sequences with some joint distribution and you compress them separately reconstruct them together and you have to mm, you have to recover what the original sequence is and it turns out that so what you are interested in is the rate of these two so you have a rate here and a rate here and it turns out that the the region for this thing is exactly given by the rate for that so the the slepian wolf theorem says that if you have two rates rx and ry satisfying these three conditions then this task can always be solved. And conversely, if there are any rates that, such that this task can be solved, they must satisfy these three, these three constraints. Okay. okay. So what has this got to do with omniscience? So if you look at this setup, let's say instead of going to some common encoder or some common decoder, you had a system that's very similar, but instead of, so you have an encoder here and a decoder here. So, okay, what I mean to say is, instead of it going like this to this decoder, 
let's say my information traveled from so yn got encoded and it got sent to this terminal here right and xn got encoded and sent to this terminal here right and what we wanted to do was so this terminal so imagine this common terminal is not here so imagine that this thing, the terminal that is seeing X, receives some information from the terminal that is seeing Y, and it itself is going to reconstruct Xn and Yn. And similarly, the Y terminal is going to also reconstruct Xn and Yn. Okay. So if you look at... Um, if you look at these rate regions, right? So if you have these holding, then the, then then notice that R X equal to H of X given Y R Y equal to So if the terminal here transmits at that rate, right? Um, then this guy here, which already has the entire Y sequence, will be able to recover both X and Y. Does that make sense? What? So, okay, wait. Um, think of these as two different step and wolf problems are operating in C at the same time, right? So let me do this. So you have X, you have Y, the sequences. So let's say you have an encoder here, FX and FY. So let's say this guy has a connection from, so it sees the X sequence and it sees the output of the Y encoder. And this guy sees the Y sequence and the output of the X encoder. Okay. So now this is kind of like saying that, um, if you look at these rate regions, right? So this guy is getting Rx bigger than or equal to H of X given Y from X and H of Y from Y. Right? Because it has access to the entire Y sequence. Similarly, um, so let's say R Y equals. And similarly, the same thing happens for the other one. So you have R X equal to H of X and R Y equal to H of Y given X. This is sleepy and wolf with side information. Two, two instances of that problem. Two instances of that problem, yeah. Yeah, and, and you're getting the entire sequence yeah. of one of these. Yeah. So the, the point to note is that if if such a transmission happens, then this guy can recover all of Xn and Yn. And so can this person. Right? And this is essentially the communication for omniscience problem. So now let's say you have M terminals, they communicate among themselves so that each terminal can recover the information that has been seen by every terminal, right? So you have M, whatever, four terminals. So this guy sends something, sends something, sends something, and already had access to the first had access to its own sequence and it has to recover all four. Okay. And you do this for every terminal. Right? 
So, um, and 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 the question that you ask is, what is the minimum sum rate? So you add all the rates of communications up, and the question is, what is the minimum sum rate that allows this kind of communication to happen? And that is called the communications for omniscience problem, and the rate is called R C O. Okay. Now it turns out which was shown by someone in the audience that um, that the rate here is exactly H minus the shared information of um, so H of X1 up to Xm minus the shared information. Now you will notice that if um, if this was a two terminal problem, then SI turns out to be the, the mutual information of X1 and X2. And therefore, and, and here the, the two rates are exactly H of Y given X and H of X given Y. And they will exactly match this formula here. Okay, so let me... Uh, the expression of shared information itself had that h of x1 to x1. So, with a normalization. A with a normalization. Yeah. So that will not cancel out. Yeah. Um, that's one thing. And let me skip the secret key capacity description. Um, if you're interested, I can come back to it later. But basically, the same thing happens. Like for secret key capacity for two terminals, equals the mutual information and secret key capacity for multiple terminals equals the shared information of this. So it at least gives us some idea that we are on the right track in defining the gen generalization of mutual information. Okay, so like I said, we now know all the terms to kind of give a short history of shared information. So this thing came out in this paper in 2004, which is which was on the secret key capacity. And this communication for omniscience problem was defined in that paper. Um, and it was shown that basically the, 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 the secret key capacity problem and the communication for omniscience problem are very intimately linked to each other. Um, so, if I have to go into why, then I have to tell you about the secret key capacity. So let's skip it for now. Um, but what was shown in this paper is that the secret key capacity, which is CM, is less than equal to the SI of XM. This was here. Now, and we now know that this is actually a, an equality. And that was shown in a series of papers um, by Chung Chan and collaborators, um, which are these ones. Uh, and then this shared information function turned up in like a very particular hypothesis testing problem and has been extensively studied in this paper, which I invite you to look at. Um, so the proof of tightness and so, Proof of tightness, meaning that the secret key capacity equals the shared information. That also uses the Dilworth truncation and some heavy machinery is involved. So, and that is all done in this paper, as is the data processing inequality and some other results. So, please look at it if you want to. Um, and then it has also found an application in like clustering. So, the idea there is that like very, very, very high level idea is that kind of sort of the partitions that you're looking at. We have already shown that the internal SI is bigger than or equal to the SI of the whole thing. So in some sense, the partitions inside a subset are more closely linked than partitions, than things outside in different subsets. And that is the idea behind using it for clustering. Uh, this also has a whole bunch of theory behind it. So let's, let's just put it here and move on. Um, then there is also a connection to this combinatorial problem of uh, maximal tree packing um, and the pin model. 
where now for a change we have two authors of the paper involved here. Um, but again, lack of time, I'm going to move on from here. Okay, so now we have said something about why this is a good generalization. Have I answered your question somewhat? Yeah. It's rather compelling. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the next part of the talk and what we have done on this. Um, so before I do that, any questions on what has come until now? I yeah, yeah. So Shankar spoke of the Omniscience problem where people have data that says there's a, a large file and everybody has a piece of it, partial knowledge, and everybody wants to inform the entire file. But the, the generalization of this is that different parties have different uh, variables that are correlated. And then uh, each one wants. Each one has some data, but wants only a subset of the others, not the entire thing. That's called the data exchange problem in general, and that's much harder to I saw something about submodularity after this. What was that? Oh, yeah, I'm going to come to that. Okay, so we have spoken a lot about shared information, but I guess we will all agree that the that the formula for shared information is kind of nice and ugly at the same time because it has this nice form, but you know, there's a minimization over partitions involved. So the question is, how do we deal with that? Like, if I tell you, if I give you a set of random variables and I tell you, compute the shared information for this thing, is there any way other than just brute force minimizing over all partitions? So that is the question that I'll come to next. I'm sorry? It's probably in the hard, is it not? Actually, no. So if the distribution is known, then the same paper, on oh, I see. so they give there is an efficient algorithm and that was that to Fujishige. yeah so fujishige had this fujishige has some classic papers on polyhedral optimization yeah then, then they were probably looked at it yeah and 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 so these people use some i some ideas from submodular optimization to get actually a kind of sort of polynomial time algorithm for solving this problem um, but you will notice that one important thing here is that your underlying PMF needs to be known, right? So if let's say you have a binary system with like, I don't know, 15 variables, right? Like 15 random variables, all jointly distributed binary. Then you have like two to the 15 things that you need to learn. In Z quantity, the algorithm is polynomial. Yeah. 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 So if if I ask you that what is the sample complexity of estimating the joint distribution on just the small problem, it's prohibitive. So you do not like even though this algorithm exists, the point that I'm trying to make is that there is some reason why we should be looking at other ways of computing shared information. Now okay, and yeah, so and and Okay, you can ask, what if I do not want to find out the whole joint distribution? What if I just construct partitions and you know compute this this divergence and see how that goes? And that is also horrible. Um, in fact, the number of the the number of ways to partition a set of n labeled elements it turns out it has a name. It's called the Bell number. And as you can see, classic, classic, yeah. As you can see, that number is not friendly. Right? Even within this line, you have already hit some 10, 15 digit number. So, okay. So then our question becomes, um, what are some interesting models in which this set of partitions can be restricted somehow? And that brings us to 
mark of random fields and the mark of properties. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to what are mark of random fields um, and what is this global mark of property. So we have an underlying graph, which is G. And there are these vertices um, M and there are random variables on those vertices. And what this graph is going to encode is conditional independences among these uh, among these random variables. So the way that works is for that we need this notion of separation. So we say that if there is a set A of vertices and another set B of vertices, and you look at any path that goes from some vertex here to some vertex here. Now, if any such path has to cross at least one vertex in S, then we say that this set S separates the set A from set B in the graph. Okay. And the global Markov property says that if such a thing happens, then there is a Markov chain says that XA and XB are conditionally independent given the middle set XS. Right. And that's the global Markov property. Okay. And one example of this is the Markov chain on a tree, where the underlying graph is a tree. So that's something that's nice. Um, so our question becomes like, does this have a nice result for chain information? And the answer to that turns out to be yes. Um, so the the main result for the rest of the talk is the shared information for the Markov chain on a tree equals the minimum mutual information across any edge. So you look at all of these edges, compute the minimum mutual information. And whatever is that minimum, that will be your shared information. And I'm going to show this result. It's not a very difficult proof, as other people in the audience have noted. Um, and the fundamental partition which again is the finest partition, is obtained by cutting every edge that is achieving this minimum. So let's say this one, this one, this one are the minimum achieving edge, cut all of them and you get the fundamental partition. So like if you cut, then, you know, like if I cut these edges. The part of the tree is actually left. left. Yeah, yeah. So it, what, whatever is left is a forest. And those will be the atoms of the fundamental part. You can't even delete the edges and then when you say cut the edges, you mean delete the edges. Just cut the edges and so remove. 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 Yes, yes. So this thing goes away and you get this one, ah. this one, that one. And this is easy to see because like the shared information of one, two, three will now be some mutual information which is greater than the minimum of the whole mm -hmm. thing. Is it how the code was this induce a nice nature um partition, right? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So like now you cut edges and you get like a disconnected term, right? Because the you started off from a tree. Yeah. And in this case it would be exactly these ones. So this was actually known from the 2004 paper, um, but over there, the proof kind of used the secret key interpretation and some stuff that came from there. Um, but the proof that I'm going to present to you now that does this proof without looking at the secret key capacity at all, it just looks at properties of shared information and moves on from there. Okay. So, the very high level picture is that the set of partitions that we consider can be successively restricted to some nicer and nicer set. So the first restriction is that the atoms of the partition must be connected. And the second one is that the complements of atoms must also be connected. Um, sorry. Um, okay. So before I go further, is it clear that 
for a tree, once we have these two properties, we basically land up. So, okay. So for a tree, um, only partitions obtained by cutting an inch as both. Is that statement clear? So the idea is that single edge. Single edge. So basically, like, okay, so first we have said that the atoms are connected, right? So you have this kind of a system, let's say. Okay. But if you had this system, so let's say I remove this one, then the complement of this atom is now disconnected, right? So if I cut, then whatever is remaining is a disconnected graph. So that cannot happen. Under if if I show both of these results, then so the only thing that is left is basically you have one big partition here and some edge. I mean one big set here, some edge, and another big set here. If you had more, then removing one of them would disconnect the other two. That is the idea. So once I show these two results, I know that just two partitions is are going to achieve like partition into two atoms in this particular way are is going to achieve SI. And the only thing remaining is to then minimize, find the minimal edge. But, but you can't have an edge so that the complement is not connected. It can also happen. That's not allowed. That's not allowed. That's that's the point. Those edges. I'm sorry? Cutting on the edges that leave the complement connected. Yeah, so the point is the only way you can do that is by cutting a single edge. And so if you cut a single edge, then you have two atoms which are disconnected from each other. From each other. Connected within themselves. Connected within themselves. So connected within themselves is from the first part of it. So I'm going to show that atom, it is sufficient to look at partitions in which atoms are connected. Then inside that set, it is sufficient to look at partitions in which complements of atoms are connected. Once I show those two, the only things that are remaining are partitions obtained by cutting a single edge. And after that, the only thing that is remaining is to minimize overall edges because um, I should actually mention that. So let's say this one is pi 1 and pi 2. These are two atoms of a partition. And so if SI of these two or um, so the divergence expression, which is the divergence between the joint and the product of marginals, yeah. Uh, on the very extreme side, your partition can be just one basic. Yeah. Everything yeah, that can happen. That, that is also that is an option. Yeah. yeah. So it depends on where your least mutual information edges. Oh. But that's that's all that matters. Yeah. So the point here is that the this divergence expression becomes just the mutual information between pi one and pi two, and then you can use the chain rule, expand this out, and you can use the global marker property and drop certain terms. So what will happen here is that, so let's say this is my vertex one and vertex two, right? So this will look like uh, i of x by one, x by two. This will be i of x one. Is that what I want to do? Sure. i two plus the conditional. So x pi 1 without 1 and x pi 2 given x 1. And we, since this is a tree, we know that any path from pi 1 
to pi 2 must pass through 1, the vertex 1. And therefore, we have the Markov condition, which is x1 times uh, x by 2. Sorry, x1 in the middle and x by 1 by 1. And then this Markov condition implies this mutual condition of mutual information is 0. And similarly, you can, there, like, you can expand the remaining term and so all of this will just reduce to being the mutual information between one and two, and then you just minimize over all edges. So all that I need to show now is that atoms are connected and complements of atoms are connected. So this proof is not super difficult. Um, and in each case, so, okay. So what we are saying is SI equal to min over partitions, mean over all partitions of something. We want to say that this is mean over uh, partitions with uh, connected atoms of the same thing. And then further restricted to mean over partitions with connected atoms and complement connected atoms of the same thing. So do you agree that like, this direction, so SI is less than equal to the two new classes, that always holds because this side, the, the partitions are unrestricted here. Yeah. yeah. So the upper bound is clear. Um, what we need is a lower bound. So what we want to say is that for every partition without the specified structure, we can construct another one that is at least as good and has the specified structure. So this is what I will do. And it's not long. Okay. So let me see. So let's say my I have this partition, pi 1 up to pi k. And let's say pi 1 is disconnected. And I'm going to write pi 1 as the union of 2, 1 to t of al, where als are maximally connected subsets of pi 1. So inwards, what it means is, you have a pi one which is disconnected. So like there will be one blob here, one blob somewhere else and so on. So you look at, so each blob is like maximally connected. So there is no other vertex that is in pi one that you can add to this blob and remain and let it remain connected, right? So you identify all of these blobs, okay? Okay, now, so let's say you have this tree structure, you know, some random tree. And let's say you have a blob here, blob here, blob here, um, blob here. I don't know. So let's say the blue things was your pi one. And these things are now your A1, A2, A3, A4, right? My claim is you will always be able to find one of these A's such that every, such that all the other A's will be contained in one subtree rooted in that A. So, okay. So what I mean by that is if you look at A4, then it has the property that, you know, all the other A1, A2, A3 are obtained in the subtree or, or are connected to A4 via this one edge, right? A2 doesn't have that property because A2 
like on one side it has a1 on the other side it, it it has a3 and a4 so a1 has the property i'm looking for a3 has a4 has a2 does not so it's very easy to actually identify this set because you start from one of them keep following the edges that have other pieces of pi 1 and at some point you will run out and stop there and look at where you came from right so um so i'm going to identify from this i have let's say i have, I have zeroed in on a4 okay so i'm going to identify this vertex okay, which is the immediate neighbor now from this maximal connectivity we know that this vertex is definitely not in pi 1 right it's somewhere else so this thing let's say is in some pi u okay but then notice that pi u if i remove pi u then a1 a2 a3 will be disconnected from a4 right the point that I'm making is pi u separates a4 from the other bits of a okay? or, or the other bits of pi 1. Okay? So we have this uh, Markov relation, which is a4 with pi u with pi 1 a4. Okay. And now you can apply data processing to this thing and you can say that uh, the mutual information between this and this on the extremes is going to be less than the mutual information between this and that. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to construct two more partitions starting from this one. Okay. So those partitions are going to be, on one of them, I'm going to take this pi u and add it to pi 1. So it's going to be pi 1 union pi u and the rest of the stuff remains the same. In the other one, I'm going to remove this a4 from pi 1 and the other stuff remains the same. Okay. Now, you can show that if I assume that the original partition was better than these two new, both of these two new ones that I have just constructed, then things simplify and what comes out is a contradiction to the data processing inequality applied to this. Uh, yeah. Second partition, you bring out A4, where do you put that? Into its own thing, sorry. It's a yeah. partition. So by one without A4, add a4 becomes its new thing. And yeah. yeah. I don't, it's not necessary for this proof. No? Yeah, I mean, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, the point is that, um, like, if I have these partitions, and I look at all, I decompose all the partitions into like these maximally connected uh, subsets. Then these maximally connected subsets will form their own tree, which is again going to be a Markov chain on a tree, right? With agglomerated vertices. Um, yeah. So one thing to Based on the, you always exist uh, such condition, uh, such condition that A4 is A4 and pi U and pi 1. Huh? It is A4 form a Markov chain, right? So for any arbitrary P and the, for any um, partition, you, always, you can always find a such way. Yes, yes, that is the point. So the idea is quite simple. You start from a, 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 this blob which doesn't have this property. So it doesn't have this property that deleting every any one edge is going to disconnect this block from the rest of it. So follow one of those edges, which contain other bits of AL, go to the next one. Let's say that doesn't have this property, do it again. Keep doing it 
because it's a tree, there are no cycles. At some point, you will reach something that that is the last of its kind. Right? So let's say you started from A2, you will reach either A4 or A3 by doing this. If there was something further down the line here, you would reach that one. And that will have the property that you're looking for. And because of maximality, the immediate previous vertex lies in somewhere else. And you can then put find whichever atom that belongs to and run this proof on it. Um, one thing to note here is that these, the two constructions that I have given, right? So A4 was like a, so you can construct what is, you can think of it as a disconnected index of this system, right? So like um, look at every atom of the partition. If it is a disconnected atom, then um, increase some counter by one, right? And, or increase a counter by the number of disconnected pieces, right? Now, if you do this, what I just said, like construct two partitions, we know that both of them cannot be worse than the original one, right? So one of them has to be at least as good. So go to that partition. What we have done is the number of disconnected pieces has now reduced by one, or at least one, right? So you keep doing this un until you land up with partitions that are with, with atoms that are connected. And what this result shows is that given start from any partition, you can always go and find out a partition, which is um, you will you will end up in a partition with connected atoms and not having hurt hurt shared information. Um, okay, the next bit is even simpler. So if you want connected complements, so we have already shown that atoms themselves must be connected. So the reason why that is important is because uh, let's say, so let's say there's six, seven, eight, two, three, four, five, these are atoms of the partition. Right? Now, okay. So we know that nothing from seven can be here right? because we know that the we are looking at a partition with atoms that are connected. Therefore, like they must be separated in this way. Right? Now I'm going to construct two new partitions. So let's say this is a blob, the left one, there's something in the middle and a blob on the right. And I want to say that you cannot like, it's sufficient to like, I'm, I'm going to construct another partition that doesn't have this property. And the way I do that is I take that one and chunk everything that is here into one piece, one atom. Right? And that is one partition. The other one is I take all of this and I chunk it into the diff in, into one atom. Right? And what you can show again using the Markov properties is that um, at least one of these partitions will be better. Now, this is like really simple to show if you just write down the, the expression inside the minimizer and just manipulate it, add stuff, add stuff, subtract stuff. This will just come out like, pretty much instantly. And one thing to note here is that I did not need to use any Markov, like nothing of the tree properties. I only needed the separating property here. So if you have a system, in which it is sufficient to look at atoms with connected, like partitions with connected atoms, this property comes for free after that. Right? Okay, so now we have this theorem that, or a different way of stating this theorem, that for a Markov chain on a tree, uh, atoms of a partition are connected and complements of the atoms are also connected. It's sufficient to look at only such partitions. And of course, you can ask the question, does the structure generalize? And we show that it does it. Um, so there is this very simple example with, a, with four variables. 
Um, and you can actually do some numerical work and come up with an example in which the partition structure looks like this one. So the two black ones are in the same partition, the same atom, and the other two are in different atoms. Okay, but we can also show that, you know, does not generalize. so does not generalize. So as in atoms of a part, like it's not sufficient to look at just um, these partitions, which I've identified here. It's not sufficient for which graph? For this graph. Yeah, so maybe for some other it is. No, no, I know. So I'm going to, that's the next okay, so two minutes. If it does not generalize, it's not properly described. So what I mean is, if I give you an arbitrary Markov random field with some arbitrary graph connectivity, maybe, yes. then we can't, so it's not that this property continues to hold for general Markov random fields. Mm -hmm. But it, it, does generalize. it does hold in some other things. So the example for that is this, what we call the click on graph. So I'm just going to flash the picture in front of you. Um, so what it means is that there are a number of vertices which are all connected among themselves. So this is a clique here. And each vertex is the root of a tree that kind of goes up. So here it's all a tree and inside it's all fully connected. And it turns out that this it's sufficient to look at uh, partitions of this structure for this. The tree is these T1, T2. Um, those are trees. Those are trees. So you have like uh, some stuff here. Okay. Um, so the idea of this was like you have like hanging trees of click Elon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I have overrun on time. Um, so we have a few ideas of how to apply these things. So for example, if you have like a leader follower network of robots, so like let's say the leader robots have some very good transmitters and receivers and they can all communicate among themselves. But the follower robots are like kind of not good. And so you can model the transmissions between the leader and the followers and its followers as a tree and not lose much. Whereas when you are looking at the communication among the leaders themselves, you really want to look at all the connectivity among themselves, right? So in general, what we can look at is settings with like a very strongly correlated set and anything outside is like weakly correlated and, and the secondary group in some sense. So some other examples are like biological neural networks, like, you know, a whole bunch of neurons connecting to one part of the brain and you kind of get the picture. <laughs> um, okay, and, and the idea is that you're kind of moving from a tree to a general uh, mark of random field and it's somewhere in the middle. And the theorem that you get is basically this one. So the SI of the whole thing turns out to be the SI, the minimum of the SI of the central thing and what you obtain by cutting edges in the trees. So I'm not going to go through the proof. Don't worry about that. Um, anyway, so I'm going to just end here. Um, if anybody is interested in the proof, I can talk about it offline. Um, but the point here is that like, we have looked at some shared information and properties, and we have looked at some a special formula for a tree model and some extensions to non-tree graphs. Um, and there are, of course, more things one can do. So one interesting direction is be looking at this graphical model that we have, um, the, the click Elon kind of structure. It's kind of intermediate between a tree and some general non-tree graph. Um, but we can look into like if learning such a structure from data is possible. So 
one point here is that learning a tree structure from data is like really, really easy. Um, there's a well-known algorithm for that. Um, and of course, are there more general models in which the shared information structure or the partition structure for shared information becomes easy? Like it, it does for these two models. So that's it. Isn't both uh, of those trees are connected by computer? Um, that is a question that we have been looking at. Let's uh, say it's just a cycle. So Madhura has some ideas on that. Um, I don't think it will work for a cycle, does it? It does, right? If you have cycle, but you have at least you are telling all those things, right? Huh. So in a but a cycle will be a block in itself. So cycle will be a block, right? Yeah, cycle will be. Yeah. So in words. Yeah. You are the, the, I think the proof will still go through, yeah. So the point is that you can generalize this to, so this thing, um, that's what we have been looking at. So this thing here is a, you can generalize this to something more than just um, a click Elon graph. So, and that in it, Kind of turns up in in it 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 is in terms of these blocks that are um which are like subsets of a graph without a cut vertex. So then, if you do that, then you can generalize this and the min. So instead of a minimum over just these things, you have a minimum over all blocks, and that's one generalization to look at. But that's Madura's idea for doing this. So yeah, it can be pushed. Like we just found this this graphical model and you know it worked for this, so we just moved on. And we also saw that it doesn't work for arbitrary graphs. So we did not really look at what happens in the middle. But there are some things that you can do in the middle. Any other questions? Yeah. The original MCP then the formula. So then you want to check it. Yeah. In effect, you have to learn mutual information, which in effect is a different two dimensional model of the Yeah. In general, the entire joint distribution would be equal. Yeah. yeah, so the idea is that if you, so we just have to identify the minimum mutual information edge. So if you just sample all the edges, so let's say you have some way of identifying what the edges are and you sample all those edges and pick an estimate mutual information, pick the edge with the smallest estimate. So that gives you a way of estimating mutual and estimating shared information for this particular restructured graphs. And yeah, so uh, since I've mentioned it a couple of times, let me just write that down. So, um, so tree structured model from data. This is something called Chow Liu trees. So, and what Chow Liu trees does is it looks at the, the, the Chow Liu tree is the tree that is closest in the sense of divergence to the general joint distribution. So you have D of the joint and all tree structured distributions. So the right hand side is kind of like, as I've written it, it's kind of ill-defined. But the idea is you throw away all the, so you identify some tree and write the right side as like P of X1, P of X2 given X1, and P of X3 given X2. 
two and so on like if if and then let's say p of x four given x two so if the tree were like one two and three four then you write the right hand side as this kind of a joint distribution and you minimize that divergence over all possible tree structured distributions like this and that will give you charlie trees and it's like very simple to do this um and so this will give you some way of identifying the edges and it's also known that if the data comes from a tree structure distribution then it will actually identify the which tree it came from so like so if you have a tree structured data learning the tree is not hard is the point so we can say that after you learn the tree then you estimate si for the tree and therefore and then this algorithm of picking the minimum mutual information edge kind of picks up from there any other questions thank you okay thank you Thanks, we'll present. Thank you.